My guest today on Dan's Talks is Scott Horowitz, who is the president of the Southampton Town Trustees. A lot of people will probably think that is means you're the town supervisor, but it doesn't. You have a fish behind you and a bunch of other stuff. Tell us who the trustees are and how it goes back 400 years. Right. The, the, the trustees, <laughs> the trustees um, go back to 1686. Um, they uh, got their powers from King James II. And uh, we are the oldest continuing elected board that there is in North America with the, one of the most important jobs that was very important back when they started the trustees. Uh, they were colonial uh, patents that granted um, lands and underwater lands and, and purview over shellfish and, and importantly, purview over what in modern day is the economic engine to our community, the Hampton, Southampton town is who I'm representing. But the colonial era patents from the highest point of the dune to the high tide mark, which is the general area where people like to frequent and enjoy the beach. So this, this was done some 300 plus years ago with a lot of forethought and it has survived uh, through, through many, many battles and it's, and it's survived through much legislation, uh, thankfully, because it is so important today in the modern day. And it's un amazing that some of the same struggles that perhaps existed in the prior 400 years are still existing today. And, and myself sitting here as the president, I took over the presidency on the 10th of January. So I've, I've, seen, I've seen five terms of, of issues uh, I'm trying to lock things down for what I think is one of the most important responsibilities. What do the, what do the trustees? What do the trustees do? What are they? What's what do they oversee? And well, the trustees are seeing all the underwater lands of the entire town of Southampton, and it and it oversees all of the uh, the shell fishing activities that go on. We're we're responsible for the public safety on those waterways, and we're also responsible for keeping the beaches. Uh, open and accessible to everybody in the township to utilize. Uh, we also own some of the roads and um, we work on a lot of projects uh, that have an environmental benefit uh, and also have historical heritage benefits for the commercial fishing industry that has been involved uh, in our town forever. We also oversee the Meacox Bay. Meacox Bay is a watershed out in the water mill area. Uh, it has great impacts and effects to, to everybody in our, in our entire township and beyond. And making sure that that bay and Sagaponic Pond stay healthy is also one of the important responsibilities. How do you, how do you keep the uh, pond and the bay healthy? Well, what we have to do is we have to monitor carefully the, the water levels and the various conditions in those, in those waterways, you know, uh, salinity and dissolved oxygen. And it, Certain points in time, we actually have to physically cut a trench 390 feet by 10 feet across the barrier beach so that we can get a flow of fresh ocean water uh, into the, uh, into the uh, bay and also let the water out. What happens is if the water table gets too high, it starts to have very drastic effects on all the surrounding agriculture. It starts to drop the salinity so low, it puts stress on shellfish. It also creates problems in all the surrounding neighborhoods, in their septic systems, uh, in their basements, uh, on the roadways. Uh, it is an important balance that has to be handled on a proactive basis. Past five years, it's been more reactive than proactive, but we're kind of straightening that out. But this is something that affects our entire township and beyond. And that's one of the you know, very important responsibilities that we handle. Um, do you, does that usually wind up taking place in the summertime once a year? No, in, in, in our case, the only thing that will take place once a year is a long dredge that we do that is roughly 200 feet by 1,000 that removes sand from a delta that's in the interior of the bay so that that sand can get out into the littoral system. Uh, it's a dynamic situation, and depending upon how Mother Nature treats us with, with, with rain, can, rainy conditions and runoff, we can open this thing up five, six times a year because whenever that level hits a certain point on a placard, we know we are having environmental problems and we have to take action. Uh, finally, we've been granted a permit to be able to do this for the next five years, free of encumbrances, with the exception of the Endangered Species Program. 
Uh, when there are birds in the area, that's going to require some extra steps to have a huddle with the DEC and uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife. But generally, we would, we would see that situation coming and we could plan for it. So it happens a lot more than once a year. It happens whenever Mother Nature dictates the terms that says, if we don't open it, we're going to have an environmental disaster. I, I read um, a history book that told about how they used to let the pond uh, back in, I think there's entries in the uh, town records uh, about 1645, 1650. And um, it, they had passed a law uh, at the meeting house that says uh, every able-bodied man between the ages of 15 and 60, I think it was, or 18 and 60 has to go down to help uh, open the open the pond because back then, of course, we didn't have what we had today. We had uh, horses and plows. So that's how they, they, they had to accomplish that at that time. I've always wondered on, if you know, why if they, they were doing this from the beginning, the first settlement was 1640 in Southampton. Uh, and these entries are 1645, somewhere around there. Uh, why did it become necessary for the king to issue a, an order? Uh, do you know? I don't. I, you know, I, 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 I would suspect seeing the challenges that we have in modern day times is <laughs> that they, they were also facing the same problems where you had certain groups of people that for their own benefit or their own agendas were, were trying to create situations that weren't working out for the rest of the townspeople. And, and, it, and it still holds true today, which is why I spend a lot of my time trying to lock down uh, what the rights are uh, and responsibilities of the Board of Trustees. And equally as important, but locking down the funding so that we can continue to provide the services and protect the natural resources and access to the waterways that is so needed today. So I think there was a lot of forethought that went into uh, issues and concerns that would pop up uh, from people that were trying to get down to the shoreline, whether it was for fishing concerns, whether it was for gathering up seaweed, rocks, whether it was for dealing with, you know, you know whaling interests when, when whales were brought up on the beach or shipwrecks. There, there was a need for people to be able to access the waterway to take care of things and to get from point A to point B in an unencumbered fashion. And it still holds true today when you have large chunks of the waterfront built up and purchased by people that don't necessarily want the public to be, to be uh, you know, in their backyard, so to speak. And um, there's been a rhyme and reason to everything. And thank goodness that it still carries through, even through many challenges today. And there are challenges that, that are still going on. And, um, you know, I think it's a very important function. I think it's the trustees have the heart of the Hamptons in their hands. It's why everybody is here. Uh, as I said, this is my fifth term and I'm doing everything I can to lock it down for generations to come. I, th I think it's very important. Uh, where are you from out here? Did you, were you born and raised in Southampton? You know, and how did you decide that you wanted to run for trustee? Well, my, my story is an interesting story. I was actually born in Brooklyn, New York. And um, my family moved, I would summer in the Hamptons and I would fish with my uncles uh, as a very young, young kid. And uh, in the early seventies, uh, I moved to the Hampton Bays full time. So I was living in Hampton Bays from third grade right on through high school. And I went to college at Southampton College where I earned a bachelor's in environmental studies. Uh, my first job was working for the trustees as in the Marine Patrol part-time Bay Constable. Uh, so I knew a lot about the trustees. I'm a licensed captain for many years. And, um, you know, I care very much about the environment. I have that degree. I run a company now for a living. Um, and I'm a very community minded person. And um, I was asked to come on board the town's conservation board. And I got appointed there and I worked on wetland applications for two terms. And I decided to run for trustee. And um, I don't play golf. And uh, I, I do a lot of fishing. That's why you see the fish. And my golf time goes to public service. I became a, a successful businessman. I vowed I'd never forget where I came from. I'm giving back to the community whatever energy I can. I became a grandfather, 
over the last year. And I've enjoyed growing up in the Hamptons. And I want to see this for generations to come. I see the challenges. Uh, I see the solutions. And I'm doing everything I can as a citizen to try and lock it all down. It's my fifth term. And I'm as energized as I was on day one. So what uh, did you did you uh, what was your work experience uh, um, from uh, when you got to the point where you needed to uh, earn a living? My work experience? Well, I, I, I worked for the, 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 uh, the trustees. I, I went to the Suffolk County Police Academy. Uh, I was a police officer for the town of Southampton on a seasonal basis, but I worked all year long while I went to college. Uh, I then went off into the insurance business and I, I founded a company with a, uh, another person that's 34 years old, a 34 year old property casualty company. Um, you know, I, I had an interesting childhood. My, my, my folks, you know, got divorced when I was young and my, my, my father uh, passed away and I ended up being the caregiver for my grandmother from 1993 till 2001 at the same time that I was raising my own two children. And I, I realized that there were a lot of challenges that people would face. I saw it from my own life and I, and I saw it, what it was like raising my children. And um, I got involved with an organization called Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Long Island. It's about mentoring children. And I founded a fishing tournament in 2001 that still runs today. It's one of the biggest tournaments on Long Island. And we've been able to raise between two and a half and $3 million from fishing for children and families in our community. So, you know, I'm a guy that I've been there. I've seen it all. And it's like, I've always believed it better to see what you can do for somebody than to somebody. And I live my life that way. I've got, you know, a, a long time running a tournament, raising money for kids, other community uh, services that I do. And now this trustee uh, role for five terms. Uh, I see this as something that is unbelievably important for everybody that lives in our township and visits our township. And uh, I live it, eat it, and breathe it every day. And um, I see the struggles and the challenges, and I try and find things to make it better. Um, I, I've got a lot of good infrastructure projects uh, under, under my belt uh, with the board over these years of, of, of infrastructure that was left to deteriorate and fall into the bay where kids should be able to be fishing or crabbing. Instead, it was snow fence and crime scene tape. And I was able to work with my board and put together funding and follow all the proper protocols and rebuild these things. I got a pier under construction right now in East Park. Um, and I've also tried to lock things down on a financial basis and really get things to be uh, to the most modern technology, the modern trustee to the point where we were able to function, you know, fairly unencumbered through COVID and get things done. And, um, you know, I, I think this is a very important role. I think yeah. anyone that knows the struggles of the trustees uh, and, and really analyzes that would know that there are, there are situations that need to be locked down for the protections for the next 400 years. And I, I intend to be part of that solution and I'm doing everything I can. Describe a little bit about what transpired between uh, the state of New York uh, was stepping in and stopping the uh, letting of the ponds, not ponds, the uh, bay, Mecox Bay, and how that caused such a big problem. Well, the, the trustees for many years had a, had a 10 year maintenance permit to, to um, engage in activities at Mecox. Some of it involved um, opening up the and letting out of the bay. And some of it was on that long dredge side, which involved sort of a sand mining operation because after there were storms, there was a tremendous amount of sand built up. And you can't, you can't just give resources away. So the trustees were getting a fair market value for that sand and getting that sand back in the littoral system. Now we're dealing with the North Atlantic. We're dealing with the dynamic environment. And there were, uh, as time went on, some allegations from some group of homeowners that lived to the west of the Mecox. They lived to the west of a steel bulkhead and there were threats of litigation. There's always threats of litigation. And there were a lot of allegations that things weren't being managed the right way uh, and so forth. And basically the, the whole process came to a grinding halt. And you know, at the same time, 
you know, there's a lot of change over it at some of these organizations like the BEC. And a lot of the people, you know, that were dealing with it, you know, dealt with it for a long time and newer folks, you know, they weren't as familiar, smart people, bright people, just not as familiar. So you, you also had some mixed messaging coming from our, our own township because there's sometimes a, a web of jurisdictions that, that kind of complicates things. You know, people are concerned about water quality. Not, not everything is in our purview. We don't, we don't permit and we're not the authority that oversees septic systems, yet we all know septic systems play a major role in degradation of water quality. And I think that between some uh, mixed messages from our town combined with some, some changeover and the threat of litigation, I think created this perfect storm scenario that ground us to a halt for about six years. And we switched off from being able to proactively manage Mecox Bay to having to get something called an emergency authorization from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation before we could move one grain of sand. And basically you had to establish uh, that there was a threat to public health and safety before they would issue that. Now we all know, having done this for, for centuries, that you have to be proactive managing a waterway like this. So yes. it was a source of much frustration before we even got to the endangered species program with piping plovers that were foraging six and 700 feet away that were standing us up. So it, it became complex, but, but, but really everybody's gotta have some skin in the game. And, and, and it's like, everybody get around the table. You know, what are you concerned about and what can we do about it? Because we can't, we can't do nothing. That's just not an option. So we finally were able to, you know, you know after three public hearings and a lot of back and forth, you know, communication and collaboration, we were finally able to get to a point, I think, where, you know, we're back to proactive management and we're not, we're not calling the snow plows out in a blizzard after we hear about the, the you know, the giant pileup on the interstate. That doesn't make any sense, <laughs> but that's what we were doing. Okay. Yeah. So now we're pre-treating the roads. Okay. So we're off in a better direction now, but it, it took us six years to get a five-year permit. What do you consider the uh, most, most important uh, job ahead? I know that uh, Picnic Beach, uh, is, there's a lawsuit about that and a few other things. What, what is the most important? Well, Picnic Beach, we, we've had some good rulings on Picnic Beach recently, and we're, we're working on, on, some, on some sensible solutions to the balance of what needs to be done at Picnic Beach. I'm going to I'm going to stay away from that part of that because some of it's still still a pending matter. But I, I would say, hands down, what the latest, latest thing that I've been working on is something that was promised to the trustees in, in a stipulation of settlement back in the 90s. Um, and that was that the trustees were supposed to have their own tax line. The trustees, being the biggest landowners in the town, uh, and 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 you know, having these this purview to oversee natural resources and public access, I think at the very least should have the same financial stability that a fire district or a library has, and we don't. Some of our funding comes from permit fees and some of it comes from the general fund. And in 1994, and prior to 1994, there was a bit of a uh, disagreement that led to a court overseen, a court mandated stipulation of settlement between the trustees and the town that said that the trustees revenues that they got from the general fund were supposed to be stated on a tax line. That amount of money should be there and it shouldn't be tampered with. So what we're working on now is legislation with state assemblyman Fred Thiel and, and state Senator Anthony Palumbo to get the trustees at least where we would be similar to a fire district, where we could clearly and transparently show the taxpayers that for all the services that we utilize from the town, and we, we're doing it right now as we're sitting here on this call, uh, what they are and what the value of that is, it could be plainly stated on their tax bills and it could be locked down so that the trustees of future generations know that these services cannot be removed. They, they're, they're there, they can't be defunded. There have been actual threats in, to attempt to defund the trustees um, that, at first, the, the lawsuits that came in to defund the trustees, they, they, the trustees lost. When I first became a trustee, they came down and said, okay, you guys got to surrender to the checkbooks. 
the town board has to have general control. And we were like, time out. No. And we ended up appealing that and, and we won that. And that said that we have full control over our finances and we're an independent board. What, what is the uh, annual budget that you currently have for the trustee? Well, there's, there's, there's two budgets. One of them is at the, at the town level. Uh, we're still grinding that down. It, it's probably somewhere heading around the $2 million number. And then there's an enterprise revenue budget that may be around, you know, 750000 But the reality is that a good chunk of that money not only goes back to the town for cost share on employees that the trustees have to provide services to the public, but we also are paying debt service on about a million dollars worth of bonds because we are rebuilding piers and docks so that everybody in the community can enjoy these things. So it, you know, we have to uh, also maintain in our own accounts at least a million dollars in fund balance at all times. That way, any challenges that we have to public access, we would be able to stand up and handle those things. The budget is a, is a delicate balancing act between the general fund side and the enterprise revenue side and not having that general fund side locked down as an absolute uh, becomes problematic. And that really needs to be memorialized. The trustees need to have what they were promised in 1994. They need to have at least the, the stability that a fire district would have. Uh, I think the trustees have earned it. Uh, I think they're that important. And uh, I, I think there's a good chance that we could be on the right side of history now because the, the person that signed that agreement in 94 was Fred Thiel when he was supervisor of the town. Now he's the state assemblyman. He's really got a great opportunity here to, I think, protect public access and natural resources for generations to come by helping us get this legislation squared away. So I'm, I'm just you know, hoping that, and, and we're working. I had a work session with our town board a, a couple of weeks ago. You can watch that on video if you wanna see the back and forth. Uh, that is one of the most important things that we have to accomplish now. It should have happened in the mid nineties and I'm hoping we get it done here in 22. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we've run out of time on this podcast and uh, my guest is Scott Hurwitz, the president of the Southampton Town Trustees. And thank you for being on. My pleasure, sir. <laughs>